Okay, <clears throat> good morning everybody. Morning, if we could all take our seats here. Uh, we started a little bit late, uh, we're just trying to get people to find the room here, apparently there's some problems finding the room. Welcome to this uh, parallel session uh, this morning. For those of you, that make, we're going to be talking about fake news, amongst other things, so just make sure you're in the right session, as you plan to be. Um, <clears throat> now, the vision of the EU has always been a clear one, which is uh, the guarantee, the free movement of goods, capital, services and people. Today, we're here to transfer knowledge as well. And we've invited some great guests today to share their knowledge about this subject with us. We'll be having some discussions on stage. Um, the point of the session today, it works best if you people take part. Uh, and the way we thought we would do that, if we could have a, my telephone number on stage here. There's a number up here. I'm going to come up on the screen, hopefully. What we'd like you to do, we, we're going to invite the speakers on stage. You'll say a few words, and then we'll have a panel discussion. We'll have a microphone passed around the audience. If you're not the type of person that likes to stand up in public and speak out loud, you can send your question by SMS to me live on stage. I will check the SMS and we can ask the people the questions like that. Some people prefer to do it that way as well. Uh, is anyone actually from Estonia here? Any Estonians? There's a rumor going around that Estonians don't like to speak out in public. Is that true? So perhaps this is a, a, a better way for you to do it. Um, <clears throat> As I said, this session will be about uh, information operations and fake news in the digital age. Um, we're going to explore techniques, initiatives and tech solutions to better engage our environment. Uh, a couple of other little things. There are, if you would like to tweet, uh, then the tweet, there's always already someone keen to tweet, phone ready in hand there. Um, the tweet is hashtag egov17. Hashtag egov17. Hashtag egov17. Okay, good. I think we'll just kick off with the first one. Um, just to introduce our first speaker today, uh, I was looking around at fake news. It's the thing we hear all the time, fake news. Well, fake news is nothing new. It's been around forever, basically. And I was looking around at this fake news concept. Um, my family is Italian, as my name suggests. Uh, I was born in the UK. I now live in Norway. How about that for a combination? Do you believe that story? How did I ever end up? Italian parents, raised in the UK, married a Norwegian. But if you go back to the first century, Emperor Octavius used fake news to beat his rival, General Mark Antony. What he did, he published a document. It was a fake document where apparently Mark Antony had issued his will, where in his will he said he would like to be buried with Queen Cleopatra of Egypt. This caused outrage amongst the Romans and it was used against him. So it's nothing new. It's been done forever. Um, the difference today perhaps is the speed and accessibility of it all. So our first speaker today knows a lot more than I do about about this. Um, she's been in the European Commission now since 2002. Um, a mathematician by heart who says, I always find mathematics in whatever area I work on. I'm very uh, honoured and pleased to welcome our first speaker on stage. A big round of applause for Annie Hellman. A big round of applause. Okay, hello everybody. I can see that, or I can hear that you are hearing me. So I'm very happy to be here. What I want to talk about is uh, fake news and why it has become important, and what we in the European Commission are thinking about it and what we want to do about it. So, next slide. Oh no, I, I click on this, I think. Yes. So, why is it important? Basically, I could just leave this slide and say this is why. If we look at different populations, Facebook has more population, more people in it than any nation in the world. Look at Facebook is 2 billion. Yeah, I think it's, it's on that border now. China has 1.387 billion. India, 1.34. So 
and WhatsApp, which is part of Facebook, 1.2 billion. So we are talking about a massive, a huge power here, and that is why it is important. Whatever happens in this powerful world of this kind of social media, it is important for us. And uh, what is this social media about? And I always want to say that it's about a lot of very good things. Social media is important. It's a fantastic tool that the current days have brought to us. It is about social connections. It is about networking with your friends. Like our moderator already said, a lot of us, we are not in our home country or in our hometown. We are placed all over the world to be able to network with your friends easily on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, social media is wonderful about that. I remember when I was a kid and we lived in California, uh, we called the grandmother two times a year, in the summer and at Christmas. And then there were letters, of course, all the time. But hearing one's voice and being in, in kind of a spontaneous connection, this is a different world now. You can find like-minded people, because we have all our different niche interests. We are interested in something very small, you might not find it easily. With social media, you will find, with internet, you will find your friends elsewhere, your like-minded people. I have a friend who has these weird, unpleasant cats. And for some reason, those cats, there are a lot of them in Russia. So she has a network on Facebook of people who like these weird cats. So. So it's good. Safety and security, democracy, freedom of speech. This is very important and this is also why fake news, fake information is so difficult. Because the great thing about social media is that we can express ourselves. Everybody can express themselves, not via our political choice or not via a newspaper accepting your text. But everybody can put their, your thoughts as they are. So when do we say that you shouldn't do that? Because that's really the core of democracy. It's also about equality. Your voice, well, probably it won't be heard as well as the voice of uh, your president or prime minister or queen or king. But nevertheless, the possibility is there. It's, it's about how you can express yourself. Uh, for a lot of people, another feature of these days is, is loneliness, is being isolated. Some people with the necessity to stay at home because they cannot, they cannot move, they cannot uh, connect in normal ways. I mean, it's a wonderful thing. There are lots of tools out there in social media, in the internet, where you can connect with people. And you can find your target audience because you can profile, you can... Uh, Especially, for example, in marketing, you can exactly be able to use the profiling, the algorithms. You can find the people that might need your product, and that's a useful win-win situation also. So, it's easy to link to your interest. But there are also some negative things. There's information online which is not true. We are talking about post-truth politics. We are talking about politics when what impacts the politics is not anymore different facts, but it's different opinions. News have become views. There are algorithms where we don't know why we are seeing something, why we are not seeing something else. Filter bubbles. People who are exceptions, who are not like everybody else, might not get away from the bubble that, that puts them into the same same. Uh, kind of expected area where they should be. So minority voices, are they lost? There are fake profiles, there are unethical behavior, there's hate, there's harassment, there are all kind of illegal issues. On the illegal part, the social media platforms have an obligation to, to react, and they, they do that. So indeed, it truly connects people, that's great, but there are also problems. As regards Europe, we are very keen on social media. We are using it a lot, and it's increasing. <coughs> and especially the younger generation uses social media for a lot of things. And what is very striking as regards fake, fake news is that people read their news online, especially younger people. More than half of them get their news online. And not only online, but they do get those news from social media. 
So they don't go, go to the traditional news website, they go to the place where they usually are, what Facebook says or whatever social media they're using. And advertisement revenue goes to social media, and that's why the traditional news are really struggling in Europe because the advertisement that used to be focused on TV and radio, on newspapers, it goes to social media, which means that the newspapers have been hurrying there too. Social media is shaping journalism from being in-depth, quality, uh, pluralistic, into something snippet, something short, something that people just read the headlines. And also we have the algorithms that rule what you see and what you don't see. I made a test on my Facebook page where I saw that I decided to like Trump and some other White House and other features. My news feed changed. Then I disliked him and got another news feed. So, so it does change. So fake news, what we see, what we don't see, it has become a real challenge. And I'm just going to leave this slide here just as a reminder why this is important, because we are talking about massive populations. So, there's always been fake news, as the previous speaker or moderator already said. It's a problem now because they are so easy to produce, they spread so easily, you can just share, they can reach huge audiences, and they are very fast. Immediately, a news that seems scandalous or shocking, um, it, fa it, it just spreads immediately. And this has never been before. We've had, when radio started, we had a new kind of reach of audience, but all this, let's say, a fake news, something somebody just put there for fun, that it can so fast spread, that's the thing what's happened. And it has created a polarization cycle. You are of some opinion, what you get, is more of what you like now, and it does have an effect on democracy. And if we, oops, include in that something which is not true, we do have a problem. And this is about democracy, this is about health, about all those things that are very important for the society. The, let's say the discussion about vaccines, for example, is a good example of why we have challenges. People may risk health, because of what they see online. So because of all of this, the President Juncker of the European Commission, in his letter of intent to the Parliament and in his mission letter to our Commissioner Gabriel, has said that we have to do something. He expects something, an action on fake news during 2018. Uh, what can be done? Media literacy, teaching people that online is equally important as offline, that we do need to think about what we post and what we share. That's one thing. Uh, we'll probably hear from the speakers to come about fact-checking, you know, what news are online, to check them and to make people aware that this, in fact, this news item is not true, it's, it's fake. That can be done. Verifying photos, videos, etc. There's a bit of uh, artificial intelligence that can be there. Uh, we can offer alternative narratives. If there's a news item which is debatable, alternative narratives can appear. The thing is that how do we make those people who saw the fake news that was really fast, how do we make them want to read the alternative narratives? How do we make them be interested in the other part also? The Commission is going to convene um, some groups of people. We want to have a multi-stakeholder approach, discuss with all the parties, platforms, fact-checkers, academia, to discuss what could be done and what should be done in Europe. We want to talk with the member states. Uh, we are going to convene a meeting of member states to discuss what member states see as the biggest concerns, and we want to think what we can do about those together. The big platforms are doing their best. The reality, of course, is that there are fake news, and uh, it's, it's very complicated because we don't want to stop people from expressing themselves. Um, we do believe that these are things that should be resolved together, and that's what we hope to do. We do not believe that uh, unless the content is illegal, that regulation is the way forward, because we have a very fuzzy set of what we should be regulating, and that's the mathematics in this also. Um, it's a very fuzzy area. Um, we do hope 
that we will find some solutions in Europe. And we do believe that offering alternative narratives will be the key. The challenge is where we want to discuss with all the people is that how do we then ensure that those who need to know, those who have spread the fake news, that they will see and they will want to read those alternative narratives, which is why these media literacy efforts done within member states and uh, within platforms and the European Union, they are really the key. So it's an interesting challenge. This is where we are and we hope we have a very good discussion and a lot of input from you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Annie. Um, I was just taking some notes there while he was speaking. It suddenly struck me. Uh, have you noticed how noisy it is around the building at the moment with the people outside? There's a lot of voices ch clatter and chatter. To me, the internet is often something like that as well. Everyone expressing their opinions. It's so noisy, isn't it, right? It's hard to know what you're listening to. So um, I've, I wrote some notes then, which I'm going to put forward to you in the panel discussion afterwards. Um, moving on to the next person, uh, when I was growing up as a kid at school, if you wanted the answer to a question, you'd ask a wise person or even look in something called an encyclopedia. Does anyone remember that? Encyclopedias? They were books, you know, with, yeah. Today, if you want an answer to a question, <clears throat> who do we turn to? I'll give you a clue. Uh, it starts with G and O, and it's not God, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, once Frederick, um, it was once I read a great quote once that said, if you can spell Frederick Nietzsche without using Google, then you deserve a prize. That's uh, also something. What you're saying about the internet there, with Google being such a massive part of the internet, my question is really, is Google part of the problem or has Google got something else to come with? Can they help us? Uh, we've invited someone to help us answer that question. Someone who's been working in Google for 10 years and seen many, many changes during that time. He's Director of Public Policy and Government Affairs. Please welcome on stage Marco Pancini. Yes, a big round of applause. Thank you, thank you, Pellegrino. What a great presentation. I think I never had such a, a good presentation. I, I need to record it. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. I, I will try to give you the perspective uh, of, of Google, that, as, you, as was said, is a, is a big part of, uh, of the internet, but also, is, um, we think, is a responsible player. And therefore, we, we are really looking into the issue of fake news as other issues in a, in a very uh, in, a very in a very deep way. So dealing with propaganda and misinformation is, is an ongoing challenge. And the internet uh, has created indeed a new challenge to access to information, when, but when we say access to information, we say all information, including also misleading information. But also made easier for citizens to check facts online. And actually we have uh, evidence that this is happening. 59% uh, of the internet users every day go online and fact check, uh, fact check information online. And that, that's also encouraging. So if we look at the Google mission is indeed to make uh, all the world information accessible and useful. This means that uh, uh, when a user surfing the internet and using uh, Google to search information, finding, finds misleading information, we, uh, we didn't fulfill our mission, We've, we failed. That's why we take very serious uh, the, the challenge related to the quality of, of information that we display to our users. Since uh, 1998, when we started to provide search, uh, search services uh, on the internet, search has evolved dramatically. Some of these steps were small changes, but most of them are also like milestones. Uh, I, can, I can mention some, like for example, spell check, as we said, you know, try to write Nietzsche without having Google to suggest in the, right, uh, the right spelling, it's, it's not so easy. And that was any, uh, one of the first improvements that we provided in search, but uh, that's, that's not, uh, uh, that was not the end of it. We also provide the autocomplete, so when uh, somebody is trying to search something online, automatically we give suggestions or other people search. Or what voice search more recently, so now is it possible to search also by talking, uh, speaking to your devices and mobile phone, very useful when you are on, on the go. 
And uh, last but not the least, the knowledge graph, which really is a different way to look at search, not just surfacing and, and providing information, but also like putting the information in a context. So if I'm looking for the Tour Eiffel, of course I'm going to find all the information related to the Tour Eiffel, but also uh, uh, at the top of the page, a uh, um, summary of the main uh, features, including the pictures of, of this monument. But the search is also a constant challenge. Nobody realized that how always changing is this environment, or environment also for us. 15% of searches every day are new, totally new to us. That, what, this means that we need to be ready to, to um, accept this challenge. Also, we need to find the solutions that are scalable for millions of search. So what we do in order to keep us uh, uh, up to speed with this constant ch challenge? First, we test every change that we implement in search very carefully. Uh, just to give you um, an idea, last year uh, we ran something like 150,000 experiments of different ways to display information in search. And only in um, 1,600 we made actual changes to the way information are displayed. This means that a lot of the things that you see in search are tested and tested and tested with our expert in order to make sure that we provide the better results. And second, also, we, we use an algorithm to make sure that the search results that you receive are safe. Uh, first uh, issue that we historically had to face was a spam. And as per today, we, uh, thanks to our spam filters, we are able to detect one billion spam pages every day. But second, of course, is uh, fake news, which is a sort of spam. Is uh, inform our information that are feeding, are, are feeding, are entering into your f feed and uh, disturbing or uh, confusing uh, your your understanding of of the, the reality. That's why we also put a lot of efforts uh, recently to fight against the fake news. And we came with some, some solution. And we'll mention some of them, but I'm very happy to discuss about this, and, uh, this approach during the, um, uh, the, the panel. First, we improved the search quality uh, by making sure that uh, the people that is uh, helping us to evaluate the results that we provide on search have a clear focus on making sure that uh, authoritative sources come, uh, come very high in the ranking. Uh, to give you an idea uh, of, of, of the magnitude of this, when I, say the, when I mentioned to you the experiment that, uh, that, uh, that we run uh, every year in order to improve search, these experiments are evaluated not by robots, but by humans. We are working with uh, validators and, and, and users all across the world, experts all across the world that are looking at different ways to display web results and are giving us feedback if something is more uh, effective or something is less effective. In order to do this job, we provide them guidelines. In these guidelines, uh, we updated these guidelines recently, and we made very, very clear that in looking at the page and uh, looking at the different results and comparing the different results that we are providing, they need to score very, very high when authoritative sources are uh, actually coming up. But that, that's, not, uh, that's not all. We also work on providing feedback tools for our users in order to make sure that whenever they encounter fake news they can on search or on, uh, for example, they find uh, AdWords or AdSense, so advertising connected to Google, uh, in page where fake news are present, they can report this to us and we can take action by, uh, by rating this, uh, the information in, in, in a less relevant way in one case and by uh, removing the advertising from the page hosting fake news. But uh, we cannot do all of this alone. Uh, working with publisher is key in order to make sure that authoritative sources and uh, fact-checking uh, sources are 
very relevant and very prominent in, in the search results. That's why we are working together with publishers and we are supporting fact-checking organization to help us uh, in, in doing this job. A uh, few examples working with publishers, we develop a program called the Digital News Initiative. This program is uh, meant to uh, go with the publisher to get this transition to the digital. One important part for us is to make sure that publishers and organizations are very high present in Google News and on search whenever people is looking for news. Because that, that's a way to provide alternative but, and authoritative sources. And fact checkers, again, organizations that are doing the very important job to go and check information that are available online for us are important partners. For this reason, we uh, add in important countries like US, France and Germany, uh, a fact check uh, sign near every news in order to assure, to make sure that when somebody is reading uh, a snippet related to a news uh, and this news was fact checked, the users can, can see it and so can compare uh, this news with the other news that were not fact checked. Again, these are not uh, uh, like uh, for us uh, the end of it. It's, it's a dialogue, it's a continuous dialogue, it's a continuous challenge. So it's very important for me to be here today to hear from you and answer to your question and see how we can progress in the fight against the fake news. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Um, <clears throat> Listening to you speaking there, what struck me uh, and was very reassuring actually was the fact that you say you still use humans to do a lot of the work for you. Um, you think you'd have a line of robots there doing your work for you, right? Um, excellent. Uh, our, our next speaker, uh, I've got three kids, small kids, blonde children. I married a Norwegian, they all ended up blonde, you know. Uh, my father always questioned how that happened, but. Um, they all ended up blonde. Uh, bedtime stories, love bedtime stories. My favorite bedtime story, which I read to my kids, is of course the famous Three Billy Goats Gruff. We all know that story. And it's especially relevant because I now live in Norway, of course, because the three goats have to cross the bridge, and under the bridge is a troll. We all know the story, right? And the point about the story is the first two make excuses and go over the bridge. It's the third goat that actually deals with the problem, which is the troll under the bridge. And it's such a simple story, written by Norwegians, or at least gathered by Norwegians, uh, and very relevant to the next speaker, because there are trolls and troublemakers out there, and how do we deal with them? Uh, our next speaker is a retired colonel and former deputy director at the NATO Strategic Communications Center of Excellence. I went onto their website, and the first line on their website, I have to read this quote, it's excellent. The, um, the first line on their website reads, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. I think that's a really beautiful quote, actually. Uh, here to talk to us about trolls and other things, <clears throat> please welcome Ivar Yeski. A big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you for having me here. Yes, I'm a retired colonel. I'm not representing anyone. So everything what I will uh, show now uh, um, is my, my experience from a past. And, and I painted uh, some slides with different color because I'm using knowledge uh, what NATO and my nation embedded in me. Uh, and, and those uh, slides are coming from uh, uh, NATO Stratcom Center of Excellence. I stole them, but I asked permission from my director to, sh uh, to share them with you. So th that's the reason why some slides have a different background. So uh, I will give you an uh, overview uh, of three studies what uh, NATO Stratcom Center of Excellence has done. Uh, and, and it really focuses what uh, trolls are um, about and what, what they are doing. And then in the end, I will show also positive examples uh, what, what uh, is happening or what we can achieve in, in internet space. And, and then uh, what as a user you can do with the uh, trolls. So my main message uh, in this uh, presentation is that uh, if we 
don't start deal with cyberspace, then cyberspace will come and deal with us. So keep this in mind. And my first, uh, uh, I will start with a with, uh, short video. It's about uh, a chemical plant explosion in the United States. It was early morning in a small town of Centerville in Louisiana, United States, when an emergency service operator received a call from an alarmed citizen. 911, what are you reporting? The woman complained that she had just received news of an explosion in a nearby chemical plant and ongoing efforts to evacuate the area. Almost instantly, the social media was flooded with eyewitness reports and pictures of the plant engulfed in flames. Soon, videos were posted too. Yeah, let's just get out of here, huh? Before long, a screenshot of a CNN webpage appeared confirming the disaster. Finally, videos surfaced of ISIS militants accepting responsibility for the attack. In reality, there was no chemical plant explosion. This all took place in cyberspace. It took place in internet. All the fake news, all the videos were presented. All the, all the pictures, what you saw, were, were in internet. This uh, documentary is done by Lithuanians, to, uh, and it's uh, one story uh, what happens 2014 in the uh, internet space of the United States. And uh, when there was investigation, who, who has done it, the IP addresses uh, showed uh, uh, Omsk, Tomsk, Yekaterinburg. So, and uh, uh, in our NATO Stratcom Center of Excellence, we have studied who are those uh, uh, OMS and uh, TOMS addresses, and we found out those are the troll farms that are established in Russia. And the closest troll farm to us, it's uh, only 150 kilometers away in Savushkina 55 in St. Petersburg, where are pe sitting people and commenting and working in the internet space. And we saw that uh, in this study, it's available in, in uh, Stratcom uh, Center of Excellence webpage. We found in this study that uh, the trolls are covering 3% of the internet traffic. And they are focused on political news right now on Ukraine, EU, US. And we found also five different uh, types of trolls. First is an aggressive troll who is uh, conducting uh, hate speech. Then there is a conspiracy troll. Uh, blame U.S. So, so everything what is wrong in the world, it's because of Americans. When it's bad roads in uh, Russia, it's because of Americans. When it's bad weather in Russia, it's because of Americans, because those are, they have clouds and chemicals and they are very smart. So, so some study even said that uh, Americans are hated in Russia more than it was during the Cold War. So very strange. Then uh, Wikipedia troll, troll who is copying lots of material from uh, Britannica, Wikipedia, posting out of context, wasting your time and space. Attachment troll, it's a troll with very short sentence, look here and attachment, and if you click to this uh, link, you can get spyware. Uh, the last but least there are uh, bikini trolls. And bikini trolls are very effective uh, towards uh, middle-aged man, because middle-aged man wants to bring this poor girl to the right track, and, and the uh, connection is done through the nice picture, usually girl dressed in bikini. And, and she is asking very, very naive question. Is it really true? Maybe Russia is not so bad. Maybe it's all Americans' fault. So works very well on, on middle-aged uh, man. There is a new troll uh, appearing, and this is a robot troll. This is a study what Center published this year, and uh, the trolls are focusing in very specific keywords, specific topics. And here, uh, this, this study is also available. You can study uh, how those robots are, are um, reacting on, on news and messages about NATO forces allocated here in Baltics and in Poland. And uh, this study shows that 70% uh, of the 
accounts active in Russian language, they are botnets in reality. 28% are English language uh, botnets, and they are uh, populating 84% uh, uh, of the content of the communication, and in English uh, language, uh, 46 So they are really, really taking space and uh, for conclusion about uh, botnets, they are force multipliers and they are really influencing our social cognitives and our, our, uh, algorithmic uh, biases. But Russia is not the only one who is using social media. Here is another uh, study uh, about Dash or ISIS. They are also very effective uh, using social networks. And in one of our studies two years ago, we found out that uh, they are using Twitter as the command and control uh, uh, backbone. So can you imagine Twitter, our tool, and used by terrorists? And of course, uh, Twitter is, uh, is trying to, to, to fight against that. But it's very difficult because we saw how effectively ha they have connected Twitter accounts with other, other social media tools. And there is lots of tools available. And uh, we observed in 7 of, uh, or 8 of July 2015, we, we discovered one bad guy's network. And we, we observed how it was uh, closed. So, so uh, 20 days later, thanks to these uh, links, it was re-established stronger than ever before. So if you are interested, uh, Please go to the web page. You can download all those studies and, and look very carefully. So, but uh, this is all about bad things, about good things. Good things that we also can use social media and we, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, show what really happened. So, so there is a myth that uh, there is no Russian uh, soldiers in, in Ukraine. And there is one NGO in, in uh, Ukraine who, uh, who is called Stop Fake Org. And they are really revealing that there are uh, uh, soldiers coming from Russia who are, who are uh, fighting, real soldiers. And, and uh, in right hand side there is a map where from uh, those soldiers are coming which unit they are belonging, what is their name. So it's possible, thanks to the internet, to reveal all those fake, uh, fake, fake news, uh, those lies. And, and it's, it's pity that only NGOs are doing that. And who now doesn't believe that there are real soldiers fighting, they are useful idiots, sorry to say. But not only Russians are fighting that, there are also uh, foreign uh, people. Here is one uh, Finnish gentleman dressed in uni uniform, who is also very closely linked to, to the uh, uh, things uh, what are happening in, in eastern of uh, Ukraine. So there are also foreign fighters from uh, our countries. But, uh, and, and another example, MH17 was taken down. There is still no, no uh, no clear who took it, who did it, at least officially. Nobody talks. No. But there is one NGO, Bellingcat, who has already revealed chain of command of this, uh, of this uh, book missile uh, launcher. So, thanks to the social media, thanks to the internet, we know in reality. But are we brave enough to tell the truth? Or is it only business for NGOs? Question mark. So, as a private uh, people, how we should deal with the troll, trolls? Here is another study that uh, has, uh, has uh, conducted, and uh, very simple. First, identify, then check, label, and ignore. If you want to know more, please go to the uh, uh, web page, study, or ask questions. With that, I will conclude. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you. Stay up on stage with me, actually. I'd like to invite our <clears throat> two speakers up on stage to take a seat here. 
Let's have a look. If we take a seat here. While we're doing that and getting uh, ready for the questions, uh, I've received a couple of... Just take a seat here. Uh, I've already received a question on uh, SMS. Um, the number is there in orange. That's my number. If you prefer to send a message on SMS, please do so. Uh, we also have a microphone here. Um, the first question that came in, actually, is from Luke Boss in the Netherlands. Where are you? You specifically asked to say the question out loud. My microphone. Is there a microphone at the back there? Just wait for the microphone. We can hear your question. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Luke Boss from the Netherlands. Uh, MH17 is a big thing, of course, in the Netherlands, because I think more than 200 people died in there. But that was not my question. My question actually was, how do we define fake news? I've seen false news an explosion in a chemical trans plant that didn't even happen. But, but what is fake news? My question was, if the White House nowadays tells that something, if a news item is fake, I think it's probably true. So it's, this is about information, disinformation, and uh, the speakers talk about fake news, but from another perspective, from another view, it might be just news. So how do we define, how do we know sure that the news is fake? How do you look at that? How do, we, how, do we, how do we know for sure that news is fake? Open. Yes. Uh, I, I, I still want to believe that uh, in, in Western democracies, uh, freedom of speech and, and uh, the, the truth is one of our values. You know, the, 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 the values what we are very cherishing, uh, the, the truth is one of them. And, and usually, and people, uh, when they are talking, they, they try to uh, talk about truth. And truth is what you believe. Uh, sometimes truth uh, is changed, but it depends uh, on your education. So I believe that uh, it all depends how educated our people are. This is uh, serving uh, the, the um, uh, serving uh, the, the, the truth and, and uh, our values. So. So you're saying, if I understood correctly, you're basically saying the education level of the people reading the news, it's almost our responsibility to know whether it's fake or not. This is uh, education plus the, the good services. I mean, the, the media today is, is suffering a lot. I mean, the, the, the news agencies, thanks to the internet, mm. uh, there is lots of traffic uh, ongoing, uh, uh, and the and, uh, internet brought new dimensions, a dimension of speed mm. to the, this news business. So, so, so and, and with the speed, also the quality of the news has, has lowered, because sometimes uh, the, the Informa uh, information uh, space is, is mis misused. Mm. So this is a question, how will improve the quality of the uh, journalist? How we improve quality of the media? And, and uh, uh, I want to throw back uh, that, that uh, this is a governmental le level uh, decision, how we will uh, fund or how we will uh, have uh, the business scheme for the journalism uh, in the future, especially in a time when, when uh, the speed is a key mm. and uh, the, the fake news are on. Uh, because what I hear our friend Mr. Boss from the Netherlands saying basically is we don't know if it's fake news, do we? We just don't know anymore. So it's all going to lose all its credibility. Are we just going to stop watching and listening to the news at all? It's, big, it's just going to become irrelevant, isn't it, if we have no faith? There's a mic coming there, yeah. Uh, I'm not really, uh, that's not the kind of answer that I was, I was looking for, because journalists, they take, they see what is going on, they uh, form it in such a way, they write it in such a way that the news gets sold, or that the, the, the papers get bought by the people. Mm. So there's always a sieve between what's really happening, or what we think that's really happening, mm. and what's in the papers or on the internet. So if, we, if you and I look at the same reality at this building, we see different we, we see different stories. Mm. And so what, when is it really fake? I, I'm, it's, of course, again, it's let's false ask, news. Let's, 
and there's an interpretation of the reality. I think but Annie has a comment to make. Annie, you already wanted to make a comment to yeah. that. Uh, yeah, well, uh, of course, we like to define things in the Commission, and that's been one, one discussion, that in order to do something about fake news, we need to define fake news. And, and obviously, we've come up with the, where mathematics come in again. It's a fuzzy set. I mean, indeed, something that is true for somebody else might be fake for another one. There is a president out there in the West who says news that he doesn't like are fake news. So it's difficult. It's also uh, a question of the perception of today, which has changed in the past. You would teach kids things as truth, and at some stage now we have to teach kids that what you see may not be true. Mm -hmm. So it is a lot about awareness, and it's, it's a lot about appreciation of the freedom of speech and the balance because there can be fake news. People are sarcastic or they just put some kind of crap online and it doesn't matter. But at that stage, it comes into something that is officially fake news when it can have an impact. And of course, in some news, you can, you can verify that the numbers are wrong. You can verify the picture is wrong. But the, pic the full picture of fake news is, is much more complicated. But indeed, we don't have an answer. Are you saying that math mathematics can help us understand if it's fake news or not? Did I understand? Well, personally, I say mathematics can help you... in everything in life. <laughs> okay. But and I can go on for it. No, do, you, do you want a small lecture on that? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> but you also said that regulation is not the way forward. I heard you say that. Regulation yeah, well, is not the way forward. Uh, at the moment, that's what we believe, especially because of this. Because what do you regulate? Where do you draw the line? On the other hand, as I said, we will have this process with the member states and we will have the process with stakeholders. And uh, we will do what the process in, uh, kind of indicates. But no, we don't believe that that's the way forward. We think that it's self-regulatory measures working together, agreeing on things with the platforms like Google and Facebook and the others. That probably is the better fa way forward. But mathematically, I think the artificial intelligence is developing all the time. I think there will be solutions that can be identifying the real harmful fake news much better than we think now. I think mm. that will happen. And also mathematically, the, the whole phenomenon, it's, it's fuzzy. It's not zero one. So <clears throat> yeah, because that's the problem. If you, if you can't define what fake news is, you can't apply mathematics to it, right? You need something more concrete. Uh, like I said, you yes. can apply mathematics into yeah. everything. Mm. So it's, it's a very fuzzy set, and that's in fact a mathematical concept, but it's difficult. Okay, I have case. a question come in from uh, Alexander Toplov, um, Teplov from Estonia. I'll read it. Would you like me to read it out? I'll read it out. I think this one's for you, Marco. It says, basically, why, why doesn't media or government just use tools to tell people, stop, this is fake news? And now it comes up on screen, this is fake. Is it not that simple? No, actually, we look at this problem as a quality of information issue. For us, it's not uh, really about uh, deciding or making a decision about what uh, is fake news. And, and what is happening today is very similar to what the, this person is writing to us. So indeed, when you look for information on Google News and on Google, you find on top of the page authoritative sources giving the report of the facts. On top of that, when something, some information is indeed a reason of debate, of, uh, of discussion, we also add a fact-checking uh, Inform specific uh, tool which is allowing the user to mm. see that inform the information was fact checked by a third party. They mm. saying, "Look, we checked; the information is true." At the same time, I, we believe that if somebody is looking for a true, false information, should be able to find it. If somebody Absolutely. is uh, looking for, uh, is it true that the man never landed to the moon? I think it's important that he's also finding on top of scientific information that shows that indeed there are evidence that the moon, the, the, the man uh, arrived to but the again, moon. But again, where does that evidence come from? It's just, it could, it's potentially more fake news, isn't it? Because all, we access all our information online. It's a real truth dilemma, isn't it? Indeed, but at the same time, as we saw before, Online, the great things about the online is that you have more source of information, including also fake, uh, fake or misleading source of information. Mm -hmm. But you have the possibility to fact check and to see 
um, different point of views on, on the same issues and make your own opinion about that. Mm. Uh, open the floor to questions from the floor. Would anyone like to ask a question? The microphone is there. Would anyone like... Here, we have a question at the front here. Yes, if you just wait for the microphone. Thank you, sir. Yes, hello. Tanguy Delestri from uh, Brussels. You hold it a bit closer to you. Yes, better. Um, I just wanted to make an analogy with the first presentation on the Commission. When you see um, the stock market, the stock market, stock market there is... Uh, Sometimes people try to influence the stocks with, with fake news. So you s this is because of traders who want to short uh, some, some stocks and have a real interest in that. And as you mentioned correctly, um, the um, advertisements go to the social media platforms. So we have created a kind of a attention economy now in terms of our eyeballs. Um, and my question is there, um, Okay, if, for example, at the stock market there are people who have interest like these shorters, what are the people who actually have uh, an interest to, um, to do this fake news and how could we uh, actually take away their interest in terms of advertisements and so on? It's not about Russia or other, it's really about this uh, attention economy and uh, finding a way to uh, actually resolve and do what exists already in stock market in terms that's of checks a, and balances. That's a very good question. You know, with the, especially with the troll farms we saw about there, in order to have a troll farm, there must be an enormous motivation to have a troll farm. Is there some way of taking away the incentive, the motivation of those places? Why do they spend so much money, time and resources on these things? What's, what's the motivation? I, I, I believe uh, if we know the answers, uh, I would be millionaire already. <coughs> so we, we, what mot motivates terrorists who are ex uh, exploding themselves? Or, or uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm. I, it, it's in in uh, state level. Yes, uh, there are different ambitions. Uh, this <coughs> understandable, but but uh, uh, on terrorist level. Sometimes they just want to create uh, chaos and, and uncertainty. Mm. There are different different uh, motivations, like mm. misinterpretation uh, of religion, etc. By the way, we all are living in in uh, our information bubbles, and it's up to us how much we allow uh, other including fake news, intervene our, our bubbles and, and what, uh, what we believe uh, and who we believe. This is up to us and, and this very much dependent on the education. Education, uh, how, what, what we have uh, and where we have teach, learned and also from experience. Uh, there is uh, lots of uh, recruits uh, uh, are taking from Western worlds what terrorists are recruiting, and and they they are using those uh, human uh, disappointment, especially among the young youngsters, at, and they start to really work uh, with those youngsters, uh, trying to convince that uh, you have to follow our path, and and uh, that's how they are working. When our system still works, that oh, let's put press release, and then it's done. The news have produced is done, but in reality, we have to engage more with our audiences in order to educate, in order to help audiences, mm. uh, and especially in in uh, uh, how to say governmental uh, level. Fine, Marco, you're the. No, follow the money is always a very powerful uh, approach. For this reason, for example, whenever we know that a page is hosting one of our, adver a page that is uh, spreading fake news or misleading information, is hosting our advertising, this is low quality, we take the advertising down from the page. Because it, it is about eyeballs, it's about clicks, isn't it? it it's, it's a bit like when somebody, a prosecutor in the court of law says something, and then the judge says, strike that from the record. It's impossible because it's already been put in your brain. It's almost impossible yeah. to strike it from the record. And I think that's a major motivation of some of these people, is to get people looking at it. That's it. 
And however they do to get you to look at those sites is kind of irrelevant in a way. Isn't that really part of the motivation? In it is, but that's why for us uh, this is not low quality. I mean, it, the, the idea that somebody is looking for uh, uh, attention, uh, it's, uh, it's true, but at the same time the idea that uh, all the world around, the whole ecosystem doesn't care about that is wrong. I think for us, for example, take search. Search is not about how much time you spend on the page, it's um, how fast you go from your search to your destination. Mm. And that's for us is, is much more important. So quality, quality matters. What, what can um, government do about it? What's government's role? But I come back to you, Annie. I know you said that regulation isn't the solution, but there must be something. This must be a part of the responsibility of government of the future, right? To, to mm -hmm. regulate or control or at least help us understand which information is reliable. You work in the Commission, right? So yeah, yeah. I mean, that is that is the question, and some uh, European countries are looking at possible solutions themselves. But but we do we are great believers in looking for solutions together. We must remember that not only is the the world of solutions changing and developing all the time, but also the world of fake news and the world of social media is changing. So we might find solutions now, but we need to find solutions that will be sustainable when we have more virtual reality and when the, that virtual reality becomes fake also. Mm -hmm. it's, it's important to look at this together. We do believe that there are some uh, some solutions we can find in Europe. The alternative narratives, for example, if, if there's something that is observed, people learn to alert quickly that this seems fake, this seems dubious. Mm -hmm. we, that can be checked. We can offer alternative narratives and we can interest, try to interest people to verify and look at them. So I think solutions can be found and solutions that we can agree on together. The challenge will be that those people who have seen that first fake news, mm. how do we reach them and how do we make them be interested in, it, in seeing it? Because the ones who will be interested in verifying whether something is true, in a way do it already. This is a, a, a challenge of the big masses in a way. Mm. But we do believe that we have to do something, and that's what we, we've just... The work has just started, but there is no end no. in seen for the moment, so... Yes, we have a question at the front here. If we could have the microphone at the front. <clears throat> the lady at the front here. Well, uh, uh, just uh, a provocative question for the three speakers. Uh, uh, next year, in October, uh, it will be eight, uh, 80 years uh, uh, after Orson Welles' experiment uh, on the world of the worlds. And, uh, of course, we all know the, the experiment. Uh, what uh, probably we forget that the day after, U.S. Uh, newspapers uh, and uh, actually the world newspapers were talking about uh, the panic the experiment uh, uh, had raised among the population, you know, how many had died of heart attack uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, um, in a way, the newspapers were exaggerating uh, the, the effect of the experiment because they saw radio and so broadcasting by the radio as their, you know, really a threat uh, to their market power at the time that they, they had the monopoly of the information and the advertising. So it, we saw a lot in the newspaper about the negative effect uh, of broadcasting. And of course, uh, today we have this urgency, speed and scope, but the time radio broadcasting was uh, in a way comparable to the internet. Mm. And radio at the time, we are talking about 1938, mm. Uh, it was start to be used uh, by dictators uh, all over the world. I mean, uh, think about uh, Mussolini in Italy mm -hmm. or uh, Hitler in Germany. 
so uh, if we go back to history now, I'm sure that the audience will think, oh, but this is different, it's the speed, is the scope. But again, speed and scope are really relative terms. Uh, are, for them, it was uh, speed and scope immense. Uh, the radio broadcasting was, could reach uh, everywhere. The newspaper could reach only people who could uh, read. Uh, radio could reach everybody, I mean, who could listen. Who had a radio? Uh, who had the radio and could listen, but you know, you yeah. had, uh, remember that certain point, you had uh, radio on the streets, you know, especially in, uh, uh, in dictatorship. So, um, isn't this more a problem that concern, and this is what really concerned me, is a part of the cyber um, security environment, uh, uh, cyber warfare that uh, is, uh, is a different war. <laughs> and, uh, and so we should more concentrate on that, I mean, on that kind of uh, um, in, infesting uh, the cyberspace uh, with information that uh, has different <coughs> purposes, like uh, um, directing the result of the election or, you know, threatening... Uh, uh, so basically we should be treating it as a kind of a missile, as a weapon, yeah? Some kind yeah, of exactly. It's a, it's a weapon. I mean, I wouldn't uh, so much focus on the, on the issue of freedom of expression because otherwise there will be, you know, a pitfall. Well, that was one of my questions to follow up what you're saying. Yeah. Very interesting, the fact that we've always had this spread of information, radio, whatever it is, I think the biggest difference today is radio was one way, sent, received. Mm -hmm. Now it's two ways. Yes. And uh, sideways. That excellent graph you showed on the screen there um, I, I was very powerful. It's not there now, but with all the... But, but following up your comments, should we basically be restricting the media? Should we be restricting it, going the other way? I see you all shaking your head, but... Mm. Uh, Marco, or, yeah, or, or, or Ivar, yeah. Should we be restricting it? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think that more freedom, is, with the, actually, the, more, the, the freedom that the internet is bringing is a great opportunity also when we look at the negative aspect. As we said, 59% of the people goes online, finds different sources to fact check information. And as you said, Legrino, the internet is not just uh, as traditional media be one, one direction, so, you know, the voice and uh, mm. somebody's hearing. Here, there is a dialogue, and there is a continuous feedback that we, you can receive when you produce content, but also we are receiving from our users, and that is pushing us to improve. We don't have to forget that there is a, an element on the internet that is very different from dif different media, which is trust. So people is, uh, is uh, trusting us to provide the service that we promise. In our case, is to provide uh, access to information, not to provide the information. So I think uh, there is a role that we can play in all of this, in all of this, in order to not lose uh, this Im very important trust. There is a lot of competition, and that's a whole uh, element that uh, makes me feel a little bit more optimistic. Good point, Anne. Yes. Yeah. Just to say that the example that you gave this this. Uh, Orson Welles. I mean, that was not that was not a test. That was a genuine uh, kind of audio play, and the idea was there. So, how should that have been banned? Because it was a, a play meant for people and for entertainment. So, it's very difficult to start thinking that you need to ban something, because who would be the Ministry of Truth? Mm -hmm. I think that's something that the Commissioner Ansip has said, for example, that. The European Commission does not want to be the Ministry of Truth. There would be somebody deciding what is okay and what is not. And, and what if that somebody comes close to a dictatorship? It is a very complex question because freedom of speech is so valuable for Europe and the world. I, I want to add that uh, uh, one European uh, Western value, what is not very much advertised, it's a rule of law. And uh, <coughs> hate speech. Uh, is is uh, criminal uh, criminal act or, or uh, in in many countries if if there is uh, somebody is is uh, calling for war and etc it's it's a criminal act we are very bad uh, sometimes applying those uh, those uh, rule of law I mean MH17 was taken down we know who they were 
why we apply, don't apply rule of law on, on that. So, so uh, the, and and problem with social media is that um, this is uh, this is. Uh, a space where where uh, where uh, uh, regulations or agreements need to need to be done because uh, what you will do with uh, uh, for example 2007 there was the uh, biggest uh, cyber attacks towards uh, Estonia and, and the attacks the uh, first uh, first uh, country who was uh, uh, most of the attacks came uh, do you think it was Russia? Not at all. It was one country from Africa. I don't remember. Was it uh, Ethiopia or Egypt or something like that? So, so, so how uh, we apply rule of law towards other or, or towards attacks that are coming from from uh, other countries? This is a point for discussion, and I That's know that in Europe uh, those discussions are on ongoing, and and uh, and there are there are. Um, there are already uh, experts who are working on that, and uh, we will see very soon those results. And, and uh, about media journalists, I, I just want to repeat: we we have to we have to think how we'll bring journalism back from uh, out from this hole. How we uh, and it's only uh, only when we reconsider how we finance our our journalists. Mm. And uh, second the quality of journalism. We have to invest to the uh, educating uh, our journalists to have top, uh, top level people working, working uh, for the media. And third thing, we have to educate ourselves. We have to uh, start from uh, schools, how, how it was uh, said um, by, by experts already. But not only schools, I think also elderly people, because uh, internet users uh, in seniority is growing so rapidly. So, so mm. um, uh, uh, Facebook is used much more by, by 40, 50, 60 age people than youngsters. Youngsters have moved away already. They have other tools. So, so also old people uh, require edu education. Uh, I'm, I'm time time, sometimes uh, feeling very handicapped when I'm on social media. So I'm asking from my daughter, please, please uh, help me in order to be in the same level. So. Okay, we, our time's run up, unfortunately. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Annie, Marco, Ivar. Thank you so much for taking part. A big round of applause, everybody. Thank you. Thank you take a seat, Annie. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Well done. Well done, Thank you. Okay, I don't know if we concluded anything there. Um, what I kept hearing again and again was not sure how we can regulate this when we don't even really know what we're supposed to be regulating and the cross-border aspect of it as well. What Ivor was saying at the end there about education, uh, I picked up a really nice quote from Edward Snowden. We all know Edward Snowden has a few things to say. The problem of fake news isn't solved by hoping for a referee, he says. Uh, we have to exercise and spread the idea that critical thinking matters now more than ever. The idea that one is able to see oneself, educating people to see whether it's fake news. Good. Um, we've got more, really, uh, more interesting discussions coming after the break. We're going to have a break now. Uh, before you go to the break, um, please visit the exhibition area. We've got Estonian and EU companies and organizations presenting their products and services to us. Um, you've seen it already, it's in the main corridor uh, next to the black box by the stairs. As you go in and mingle, I remind you of a story. Is anyone from Finland here? Finland? Great, excellent. Mingling is all about, is about talking to people and exchanging views. I have to share this story. I was in Helsinki once at a dinner uh, and I thought I would take the initiative by asking my fellow Finn next to me a question which I hoped he would give me an answer to and I could follow up. I asked him, have you lived in Helsinki all your life? He responded to me by saying, not yet. So that was a, uh, <laughs> was a very funny response, but it was a conversation killer, unfortunately. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> spread the word, spread the knowledge, spread your views with each other. And for those of you coming back to my session, we'll be back here at 10.45. Okay, thank you for now.
but it's not right now. It's afterwards, yeah. Okay, if we could take our seats. Sorry to break up the cozy regathering there. Uh, welcome back to this parallel session. We're going to be talking about GovTech industry innovation. Uh, for those who haven't met me already, my name is Pellegrino Riccardi. I will be leading the session, asking some questions. Uh, before I kick off, we will be hearing two speakers. Uh, we'll also be um, <clears throat> presenting, or rather pitching, five candidates for the Creative Business Cup startup innovations and how they can make eGov easier. Um, if you want to ask questions via me, I've been told that in Estonia, Estonians aren't the best in the world of raising their hands in public and speaking out loud. You may send, could we have my number up on the screen please? I have a telephone number. If you'd like to ask questions to the speakers via me, I hope so. Should be coming up. Here it comes now. I've got it in front of me here. There it goes. This is my number. If you'd like to ask a question via me, please send your question to this, te to this mobile number. I'll receive the message live on stage and can put it to the speakers. Or you can do it via microphone in the audience, up to you. It works best if you get involved and ask the questions. Um, like I say, in this session, we're going to explore the potential and status of GovTech in Europe. It's all about making life easier. Uh, even though my family is Italian, I was raised in the UK, if you're wondering why I speak with this beautiful English accent that I speak with. One thing for sure is English. I have another native speaker here next to me. English is definitely not an easy language to learn. Listen to this, guys. Uh, there is no egg in eggplant, nor ham in hamburger, nor apple, nor pine in pineapple. I have a nose that can run, where a fat chance is the same as a slim chance, but where a wise ma man is a good thing and a wise guy is not. And if a vegetarian eats vegetables, what does a humanitarian eat? So it's a pretty crazy language that we speak. And it's all about making life easier. Uh, I read a great issue of the Harvard Business Review earlier this year, February this year, which talked about customer loyalty. Uh, and it was a typical Harvard Business Review article, lots of pages, lots of graphs, lots of graphics, and they came to the very simple conclusion that you gain customer loyalty if you manage to make buying from you easy and it becomes a habit. If it's easy, and it's a habit, you'll continue to buy from that person. It's called in psychology the path of least resistance. And if anyone's used anything like Amazon, any Amazon users here? I'm a big Amazon user. You know that one click buy thing? Crazy, right? It's done, it's over. And they're getting even faster at shipping your goods, so you can't change your mind either, right? Uh, anyone use Shazam, the music app Shazam? Also, it's, it's so simple. It's one click and in. I travel a lot. I live in Oslo. I'm married to a Norwegian. I live in Oslo. I use the airport express train, which knows where you are, where the nearest station is, and where you get your train, and it's one button. It's all about ease. That's what we're going to be focusing on today. So, we're going to start with the first speaker up today, who is the member, a member of the European Parliament. She's also patron to the Creative Business Cup, what we're going to be looking at afterwards. Um, I read here that you're an advocate of innovation and frequently emphasize that regulations should not hinder the technological revolution. We had a discussion in the first session about that, actually. Um, she's the author of five reports in the European Parliament, including an own initiative report on the digital single market. So this is something you're obviously very passionate about. Please welcome on stage a big round of applause for Kaya Kalas. Thank you and uh, welcome to Estonia. Um, I must say that uh, before I became a member of uh, European Parliament, I, I never thought about the digital solutions that I use every day uh, and also the uh, e-government solutions that I use every day or almost every day. Uh, then I was elected to the European Parliament and went to Brussels, started to live, in th uh, started to live there. And, uh, you know, they say that you can only understand um, that you had something when it's gone or taken from you. Uh, so, um, 
I understood that we really have in Estonia a lot of um, uh, different services. Uh, we are living very digital lives here. Uh, so uh, lots of uh, other European countries have uh, a lot to learn from us. And that's why I'm really happy that this challenge is taking place um, in Estonia. Um, they say that the digital revolution is based on, on three things. It's more mobility mentality. More uh, means that we have more of everything. Uh, we have more countries, more people, more services, more products, more companies. Um, Mobility means that we can also uh, travel anywhere. Uh, people, goods, services, money uh, can and travel anywhere in the world, quite a fast space. And mentality means that our mentality, uh, the way we address things has also changed. We also want to have everything where we are at this uh, moment in the world. This means that the digital environment, in essence, is global. So if you meet with the entrepreneurs, then the younger entrepreneurs, they see their world or their market as, as global, whereas the um, uh, entrepreneurs from, uh, from uh, previous times or the ones who have been on the market for long have started uh, on the local level, moved on to the regional level, national level, and so on. Businesses understand that uh, that internet and the environment is global, so um, uh, thinking global is in their uh, core. It has shifted our lives towards online. Uh, it, is even say, uh, it is even said that uh, we are living on lives, which means that we have are having our lives online. And what is important that the government should also be there. If the government is not online, is not providing the governmental services online, then it further alienates the people uh, from the gov government. And there are several points that I want to share regarding this. Um, what is the key to e-government and, and uh, governmental services in the first place? And I would say uh, what is the biggest issue here is the digital identities. Uh, Secure and encrypted digital identities. Uh, for years, the benefits of anonymity on the net overweight the drawbacks. Uh, people felt more free to express themselves, uh, which was especially valuable if they were dissidents or hiding personal, uh, a personal secret. But uh, now we know that anonymity has poisoned civil discourse. Uh, it's also enabled hacking, permitted cyberbullying, and uh, made email at risk. So. Secure digital identities would solve many, many problems that we have online. Uh, for example, feedback issues in, uh, in the sharing economy, but also you know, declaring taxes, uh, using digital government services, and creating digital services. Uh, it would also uh, increase uh, drastically uh, cybersecurity if everybody had the digital identities. We have the digital identities uh, in Estonia, and, and we know that um, uh, there are. Uh, this is the way uh, forward. Of course, it has risks as well, but we have to deal with those. Uh, but we can't move any uh, any back. We know that password is a recipe for disaster. We have created a system when we talk about you know password-based um, uh, identification. We have created a system where. Um, um, people are using passwords which are very hard for the people to remember, but uh, very easy for the computers to guess. And I bring one example. Uh, one of my friend, uh, friends is a judge, and when they have different passwords for different uh, databases, then the, uh, the passwords are really, really complicated. So what do they do? They put the passwords under the keyboard because to access all the databases. So it's not very secure either.
not only the identity, but also the services that can be used once the identity problem has been solved. Uh, and, and what I want to say is that there's a misconception between uh, you know, digital being less trustworthy than uh, paper-based processes. Um, if you think about passports, then of course in the uh, border guards, uh, you know, they have the system to identify whether your passport is identical and your signature there, but, but none of us have. So if somebody uh, shows their identification, how can you make sure that they are really, really the person? Uh, so, and, and especially on the internet, everybody knows this uh, famous cartoon from the New York Times where there are two dogs talking to each other. One says that I can't do this and the other one says that uh, on the internet nobody knows you're a dog. So, so we can solve this issue by having uh, digital identities. Um, but my second point is that not only that you provide the digital identities, but you also have to provide services to take up by the citizens. So the government has to provide the demand as well as the offer side. Uh, so that th people could also use the digital identities. I've had talks with different uh, representatives from member states and they have said that, you know, uh, why digital identities? Because, you know, we have hostile people and they say we don't want them. But uh, they don't want them because they don't know what is the benefit. Uh, of course, in Estonia, the biggest benefit, uh, what we had initially, was uh, you, uh, de declaring the taxes. And, and what was the benefit for the citizens? Well, uh, first of all, it's very easy and very fast, but also you get the money back really fast. It's like two days uh, or even less. And uh, I think we are the only country in the world where people actually compete uh, with how fast they did taxes. Um, that brings me to my third point, which is that uh, governments also need to be uh, uh, to change the mindset uh, of uh, becoming um, partners to the companies and uh, and the people. Uh, so not that they punish the people uh, for for not doing one or other thing, but they try to help the people to comply with the rules. And I I, I just bring uh, you this one very positive example that I had recently. Um, again in Estonia. Now, I w I'm based in Brussels mostly and I got an email uh, from my government saying that um, your uh, driver's license is expiring, which I didn't know, of course. Uh, so here are the steps that you have to do. It was really easy, go online, you know, da -da -da, uh, check, check, check. Um, is this your picture? Yes. Uh, is this still your signature? Yes. Uh, and then confirm, pay the state duty, and here you are. Uh, uh, everything is confirmed, you get the driver's license in, in your uh, uh, mailbox. Uh, and, and this is how it happened. But this shows that the process has to be end-to-end -end, um, uh, digital. That it means that I can do everything online, not just uh, the 75% and 25% I have to go offline as well. Uh, now, all these solutions that make uh, the lives of people easier, um, they usually come uh, from the companies or uh, people with entrepreneurial spirit. Um, that brings me to my next point, which is that uh, in order to make it possible for these companies or uh, people to develop uh, different solutions, the governments need to make their data open. Governments have a lot of data that they gather, and of course it has to follow all the data protection principles and, and everything, but there are also lots of data that doesn't concern anybody's, uh, anybody's um, uh, private data. For example, transport data. If it is made uh, open and it's also interoperable so that it can be used uh, by, by anybody, uh, then the companies and the people can provide solutions on those. Um, so, um, um, and, and regarding open data, we have to have standards uh, uh, that uh, uh, make this open data um, uh, interoperable. And, and also um, the change of the mindset of the uh, of the governments 
also needs that the governments will be more open to innovation and experimentation as well. Of course, uh, for me as a politician, it's very hard to say because the voters usually don't reward experimentation or failing, but we still have to take this into account. And, and for example, in public procurement, we, we have um, this innovation criteria that can be used so that the governments that provide or uh, procure for some kind of services uh, will um, uh, use this innovation criteria, which means that uh, they will uh, take the most innovative solution and not the cheapest one. Of course, it is much harder for the government because you have to also um, give your arguments why you have used this and maybe it's easier to uh, to challenge but at the same time it might uh, bring more um, uh, growth and and more innovation to the governmental sector and and my last point and very important point is that this is all uh, based of course on trust and again trust is very much related um, to uh, uh, the way uh, government works and Again, digital identities can help a lot to increase uh, increase uh, this trust. Um, but but there is a lack of trust only uh, also um, between the member states. So if we have a European Union and we don't change uh, exchange data um, within uh, within our borders, then it is it is a problem because there might be a good solution in another member state that the other member state might not have to uh, invent. Uh, but if we don't trust each other, it's very hard to do. And, and this goes to cyber security as well. We know that we have more and more cyber attacks, but the problem is that the companies as well as the governments don't really exchange data about cyber attacks. Uh, and, and where is the problem? The problem is that the bad guys really exchange the data, develop their services further or their attacks. And if we don't share the data, we are really um, uh, left behind. Um, so to conclude, we cannot turn back uh, to the digital revolution, but we can uh, cooperate with it and we can make sure that all companies and citizens benefit from it. Um, Emerging technologies like blockchain and artificial intelligence are stretching out from the world of research and laboratories. They are in the hands of citizens. And public sector also needs to catch up with this. And I would conclude with a quote from Kevin Kelly from his book, The Inevitable uh, Technology is the reason that we have a future. For it promises a surge in possibilities, abundance of choice, and most importantly, protection from stagnation. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, fasc some fascinating stuff coming out there. Uh, I open the floor to questions, actually. Does it, would anyone like to pose a question to Kaya? There are lots of... Um, my open microphone. Here we have a brave man in the front here. Excellent. We have a microphone here. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Marta. I'm from Dreamerplay, one of the uh, public service providers from Estonia, um, Estonian government as well but also across Europe. Um, my question is um, very simple actually, <clears throat> but intriguing. Uh, what do you see uh, would be the best ways for developing the ecosystem of what you were just talking about, that uh, we would be get the best possible public services uh, with, uh, with the cheapest price, basically, for the taxpayer? Thanks. Uh, of course, <laughs> this is a very difficult question, but uh, I, 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 first of all, I think uh, what it needs, it needs political will. Political will really on the highest level that we want to do this. Uh, that, uh, you know, keeping it open, you know, having these innovative solutions in long term are more profitable than having a, ch a cheap uh, solution in, in short term. Uh, so, so I think, as I said, it, it requires the change of mindset uh, uh, really on the political level um, and that we want to do this and this is the way uh, to go forward. Great. Yes, two, two questions at the front here. 
Yeah, Kaya, very nice to see you, and thanks once again for the very inspiring words and inspiring vision. Mm. As you know, there's a proposal um, now from the European Commission on the free movement of data. Uh, the Commission is very keen to move it along, and we believe the Council has looked at it and likes it. What's, what's left is the European Parliament, and my question to you is how quickly do you think the Parliament is ready to move on this? Is it considered and seen a priority there, and do you think we can get an agreement on it uh, in relatively quick time? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, um, uh, as, as in Europe, we have different member states, and different member states have very different positions, also on free movement of data. Of course, um, we are, uh, you know, speaking for this, and, and the northern countries are very much uh, believing in this. But at the same time, we see in different member states, uh, 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 bigger member states, we see more and more um, data localization requirements, which go totally against uh, the free movement of data principle. And I've even asked uh, one government, uh, one big uh, uh, member state's government, that uh, uh, why do you, uh, why do you uh, support this? And they say that um, the data is more secure in this country. Uh, and, and then I asked, uh, you know, why do you think this? Uh, do, you have, uh, do you have any kind of uh, um, data that shows that the data, uh, you know, evidence uh, that uh, it is uh, more secure in your country? Uh, and they say that uh, we just believe that it is. Uh, so it's very hard to fight with the beliefs uh, that are not really based on, on every, uh, anything. Uh, so so I, will, I, would, I would say that uh, we're definitely going to have problems in the Council uh, because the member states and we also know um, that uh, France's new president has also spoken uh, not really in favour of the data, uh, free movement of data and we're going to have the same problems in the Parliament. So uh, I would say that we are um, really open to move forward, but, uh, but I'm also quite realistic that it doesn't go so fast. Excellent question. Did you have a question also, madam? <laughs> Yes, thank you. My Varut, I work in the European Commission in the Joint Research Centre, and I happen to be Estonian as well. So thank you, Kaya. Very, very nice talk. Um, I was wondering uh, about something that I have uh, now recently noticed in a number of such uh, meetings like the conference today, that uh, we have these very enthusiastic Estonian speakers promoting the e-government and the e-services. And quite often the main, let's say, point that is put forward as a big benefit is that uh, with these services one can save time. And I had just fantastic uh, conference uh, here yesterday on the e-taxation and really very great progress done on e-taxation. And there again the main argument that was put forward was you know you can save some time and, and actually it was quite funny. Um, uh, the taxation office here is already so uh, well online that uh, now the next step they will achieve is to save something like 10 or 12 minutes um, on the tax declarations. And I was thinking of it from the context which you also now witness, witness with many other member states uh, being present, of course, in Brussels. It somehow does not click. I mean, to tell somebody that you will save 12 minutes um, from, I don't know, a, a year, it doesn't, it doesn't make it. So would you have some ideas how to convince others or how to really bring forward the, the real benefits? So what would you use or what do you use as, as good arguments for e-government and e-services? Um, this is true that time is is not the uh, not the only only thing, but uh, but still time and costs are are big uh, arguments, especially saving uh, saving, uh, meaning that saving time, but also saving uh, saving money. Um, just my example on changing the driver's license. Actually, you know, uh, the uh, <coughs> costs for me as a person is also lower because the tax the state do is lower when I do it online because, you know, it doesn't have so many costs for the government. So it is actually uh, beneficial also on that side. Um, but uh, but um, it is um, uh, hard to convince uh, people uh, only uh, about time. But the argument that I use is that people are doing everything online nowadays. 
So, so if you know they can't talk to their government uh, or communicate with their government to the services uh, online uh, there, then governmental services are not part of their own life, basically. Uh, so, so government is not there uh, and and that alienates the people from the government even further because you know everybody is there the government is not uh, so I have to do it all on paper and the other thing is actually trust I mean the cyber uh, security is of course very often brought up but but at the same time are these things on paper really secure like like how many of you uh, you know um, made your parents' signature when you were young, like when you didn't have e-school and, and like I couldn't do it because uh, my father's signature was on our money but, uh, but I think that most of the people didn't have such a problem. Uh, so, so, you know, how can you make sure that this is the signature of a person? Uh, or, or like, for example, health. Um, they say uh, to me in, uh, in uh, European Parliament that, oh my God, you're going to the health data, it's the most sensitive data there is about the person. Yes, but it's also the data that can help the people the most. So, so it, it depends on what side uh, are you looking at things. Uh, so, and, and again, is it more secure on paper? You know the case with the uh, uh, with the Schumacher's uh, health records, they were on paper. They were stolen, you know, and nobody knew who stole them. Whereas, if you know, uh, you would have, uh, you know, got to the digital uh, database, then there's a track still. So, I think these are the arguments uh, in addition to the time. Very interesting. We're, we're running out, run out of time, actually. I'd love to spend more time on this. Very, very fascinating talk. A big round of applause to Kaya Gala Singer. Fantastic. <clears throat> Great. I, I had lots. Of, great that you also asked questions from the floor. It's really good. I have I have lots of questions. One question, or rather, what I noted in my notes was the fact that the whole aspect of trust and open data. That while the countries are reluctant to share data uh, and being attacked with cyber attacks, the actual people who are conducting the cyber attacks are sharing their data and getting really good. Uh, that was a really powerful point for me. Um, we're going to move on now to the next section, uh, we're going to be looking at um, the e-government challenge competition, the Creative Business Cup, which is a competition designed to encourage startups to present their ideas to make e-government easier. Um, it was started by a visionary Dane, that was what I was called to tell to tell you. Uh, his name is Rasmus Winstead Tianning, and I think if Rasmus, if you could come up and tell us a little bit about this competition, you'd do a much better job than I could. So, a big round of applause for Rasmus Winstead Tianning. Thank you very much, and also a special thank you to Kaya Kalas for the introduction and also for being the CBC patron. You came to the global finals that take place in Copenhagen every year in November. You came there last year. And uh, what is happening is started in 2012. We started inviting startups from around the world. We're now up to 63 countries, from China to Russia to the US, and even Myanmar is sending a startup to uh, Copenhagen on the 16th of November, where you're all, of course, invited. We also realize that startups in the creative industries can contribute to growth in many other sectors, including e-governance. I was thinking it's not all Which about data protection and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and time. It's also what, about uh, using design and using public? interfaces that actually engages the, the citizens order. and Check. make them the, use the, the government services Start better. And um, so we have now had a number of applicants specifically in the e-governance uh, area. We had 10 finalists yesterday and then five of those were chosen to present their ideas today for you. We will find uh, a winner and a two runners up and those uh, uh, three startups will go to Copenhagen and present again on the 16th of November for 63 countries and their uh, representatives of governments etc.
Um, here at the end I would say it's not all about digital Estonia and e-Estonia. I also think you should go out and discover creative Estonia because uh, we have for now over 10 years had a great co collaboration with creative Estonia that's both a concept and an organization that's able to gather all the people in the design field, in the artist field and the digital economy and create great solutions for society. So thanks a lot for that. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Excellent. Uh, uh, we have a jury as well. What, what's going to happen now? We're going to get the five finalists to come up here and pitch their ideas to us on stage. Uh, we have uh, five jury members. Rasmus, you are one of them, of course. Uh, we also have Andres Kut from Cybernetica. He's there at the front, waiting, looking excited. And, and then we have uh, Linar Vik from... Uh, where's Linar Vik? There he is there, also sitting, waiting. Uh, we have Kaya, of course, Kaya Kalas. And we have with us Daniel Korski, who also will be saying a few words afterwards. So they're waiting, paper in hand, notebooks ready. Uh, I think it's time to present the actual finalists. Uh, I'd like to start to welcome on stage, please, E-Europe. A big round of applause for E-Europe. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Rainer Sarm. I have been working uh, in market entry for five years. And for the problems in the market, uh, we have come up uh, with a business idea, import e-commerce uh, distribution hub uh, for non-EU exporters to enter entire EU market. Uh, the market size is uh, imported goods and imported services is over one trillion. Uh, e European uh, e-commerce market size is uh, third in the world. Also, the estimated uh, sales rise is uh, in 2000, 2020 is uh, almost uh, twice the size that it is today. The problems, huge, uh, huge financial ventures, uh, <clears throat> for the companies, you large expenses to start and maintain the business, EU regulations, uh, 27 different countries, hard to find partners, language barriers, and uh, what rise for non-Europe EU uh, retailers from uh, 2021. It is everyone problem, manufacturer problem, consumer problem, e-government, uh, government and EU problem. Uh, what our idea is to bring together warehousing, logistics, self-service uh, platform, Estonian government e and e-residency, and uh, what is most important, EU four pillars of freedom that allows everything. Uh, what if you don't need to visit EU but can still be all EU company? You don't have to own offices, workers, and pay utilities. What if manufacturer can be importer, distributor, and online retailer in EU Europe? <clears throat> the, our idea is uh, Europe self-service platform and cooperation platform, uh, uniting Baltic, Scandinavian uh, startups and Europe services to provide one one-stop place to enter European market without coming even Europe. Uh, we give value to consumer, manufacturer, government, and also developers. The team is international, Estonians, uh, Japanese, Finnish, and also Bangladesh. But uh, most important uh, also, we see that uh, Singapore can be in future like uh, Estonia is uh, for Europe, uh, access store to ASEAN uh, single market. Thank you very much. Also, thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. thank you. So, uh, access to the entire EU single market from your laptop. That's a dream if ever I heard one. And a very good one too, yeah? Very promising. We move swiftly on to our second pitch, which comes from Czechy. A big round of applause. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> check, check. Check one, two. So hi, uh, my name is Martin, and I am the CEO of Czech.de. So basically what we do, we take your paper receipt, 
we digitize it and send it straight to our accounting system. We work on we work on iPhone, Android, email. Uh, we even have a web application. Uh, by now, we have built integrations with most of the major cloud-based accounting softwares in Estonia. And if there's a secret I would like to tell to the delegates of Europe, then it's e-invoice. Last year, we raised 60,000 euros from accounting industry professionals. Uh, for the last year, we have grown 20% averagely every month. Uh, <clears throat> we're really popular uh, among musicians, and there's a fun fact about our company that there are four different musicians who have represented Estonia in Eurovision Song Contest using us. Um, we are the biggest receipt app in Estonia. Um, but now we want to go to the US market, because it's much bigger uh, over there. We would get immediate access to five million receipts. Uh, we know how it, we would go through Intuit QuickBooks and we would immediately get access to 300 million receipts from SMEs. But how would we be different? Because it's a very tough competition in the US market. Uh, so first of all, um, most of our competitors, they would charge you like three, five, seven bucks every month for every user in your company. Well, not us. We have free, unlimited users. Uh, and also, you pay as you go, so you only pay for the service if you use it. And if you don't use it, you don't pay for it. And this is something that the SMEs, the small businesses, really like. Uh, but today, I would like to tell you about the little niche market we would like to conquer. You see, uh, the Estonian governmental organizations have about 4,000 receipts every month. Altogether, about 350 hours is wasted creating expense reports. Please, do let us help you with that. Uh, <clears throat> While most of our competitors uh, are focused to the US market, uh, then what they do is they can only read three fields from every receipt. Uh, but in Europe, where the accounting regulations are, let's say, so much more conservative, you have to read many more fields. And that's why we are excited about our technology. You see, we can read six fields from the receipt. Uh, our team has grown to be true experts on how, exp how to work with this data. And at this point, I would just like to thank all the incredible people I have opportunity to work together with. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Yep, I think I need to speak to you afterwards. I do a lot of traveling. I know exactly what that's about. Uh, I love the pay-as-you-go aspect as well which is coming in a lot into telecommunications in uh, Norway at the moment, pay as you go for the whole family. You share your usage amongst the families. This is all really smart stuff uh, and very innovative. And we talked about incentives earlier. These are very clear incentives. Great. Moving swiftly on to our next pitch from public job, a big round of applause. Yes, big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I think we can head him off this open government nonsense. Uh, but I thought we were calling the white paper open government. Yes, well, always disposed of the difficult bit in the title. There's less harm there than in the text. <laughs> more of inverse relevance. The less you intend to do about something, the more you have to keep talking about it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> what's wrong with open government? I mean, why shouldn't the public know more about what's going on? Are you serious? <laughs> Well, uh, yes, sir. I mean, it is the minister's policy, after all. My dear boy, it's a contradiction in terms. You can be open, or you can have government. But, <laughs> but surely the citizens of a democracy have a right to know. No, they have a right to be ignorant. <laughs> Knowledge only means complicity and guilt. Ignorance has a certain dignity. But if the minister wants open government... You don't just give people what they want if it's not good for them. Do you give brandy to an alcoholic? Oh. If people don't know what you're doing, they don't know what you're doing wrong. So hi again. Um, I'm Christian. I come from Romania. 
uh, my project is based on the open government concept, which uh, itself is based on four major principles, which is access to information, civic participation, using new technologies, and professional integrity. So basically, I develop a web portal gathering all public institutions in Romania, and citizens are invited to submit uh, their evaluation uh, based on their interaction uh, with those uh, institutions. So in this example, um, we're searching for hospitals in Bucharest. We get a map of all um, hospitals and medical units in Bucharest. We're just uh, going to uh, one that already has an evaluation posted. And um, one of the customers uh, of the uh, uh, hospital mentions that he had to wait in line for two hours before actually receiving medical attention. Long story short, um, I used open data from the Ministry of Finance and created 14,000 uh, profiles for public institutions that included the names, addresses, categories, postal codes, fiscal to uh, codes, treasury, phone fax, website, and emails. Um, uh, the categories of institutions include ministries and agencies, diplomatic missions, schools, hospitals, universities, police and, police and state legislatures, prefectures, city halls, theaters. So basically everyone that's being financed by the uh, public budget. The procedure is rather simple. You just uh, register or create an account via your social media accounts. You search for the institution and agency, and then you can uh, tell, about, tell, us, tell the people about your story uh, in interacting with that government institution on uh, free uh, KPIs, efficiency, performance, and integrity. The uh, main objectives of the platform are improving the performance of um, uh, government using citizen feedback, promoting transparency and accountability, and, and openness, and increasing public sector accountability. Thank you. Great. Right, thank you. Thank you so much. Right. I mean, how can we prove, improve anything without real, live, continuous feedback? Very simple concept again. Uh, and I particularly like the way that the word accountability was raised up there. Very good word. Uh, I was told recently, is anyone from Finland here who can actually... Apparently, in Finnish, you don't have a word for accountability. Is that correct? <laughs> no, no, I was told that recently by a Finn, that you don't have a translation for... His theory was because you are always accountable, so you don't have a word for it. I don't know. So it could be a Nordic thing. I don't know. Uh, excellent. Uh, and also a very good example of bottom-up policy making as well, right? Let's move on to the next one. Another big round of applause for StatLab. A big round of applause. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. Do you need a clicker? Hello, everyone. We are from StatLab and uh, Tax and Customs Board. Uh, public administrations collect and possess huge amount of data, but use a very small part of it to create any significant value in society. And if the data is used, it's used for detecting some kind of uh, non-compliant behavior. The same thing has been with uh, tax data. The most of energy and investments to analytical tools has been put to detect fraud forgetting that uh, the data from tax declarations actually give the quickest and uh, extremely comprehensive picture about trends in economy. The problem is that this data hasn't been used regularly for macroeconomic environment analysis. Uh, attempts so far have been uh, occasional, complicated, time-consuming, and focused only to some very specific problem. There hasn't been data flow channel and system for proper analysis. We are going to change that by building a dashboard that takes monthly VAT and social tax declarations on all Estonian companies and uses machine learning to predict company turnover, number of employees, and company health metrics up to 12 months in advance. This can be done both at the level of single companies and at any aggregated level that's needed for the decision makers. We aim to speed up the policy cycle by transforming, modeling and feeding back the data 
as it is generated by companies. So policy and budget planners can get better, faster information what's going on in the economy. We are a team of researchers from University of Tartu and specialists from Estonian tax and customs board. And we are happy to say our first prototype is ready. However, our dream is to go beyond public sector, to use the same data to pre-fill annual reports that companies need to submit. A pre-filled annual report submitted by one click is the next logical step for the country where individuals already declare 99% of their taxes online through pre-filled declarations. Let's make use of the data we already have. Thank you. We are Anne Grete and Divar. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well done. Excellent. Wow. A pre-filled one-click corporate annual report. Pretty impressive, huh? Pretty impressive stuff. And again, uh, from those who were at the session before, this whole idea of open data and trust is coming up again and again. Uh, you mentioned that 99% of Estonians pay their tax. Uh, that's also a very impressive number. Um, our final pitch coming now, uh, they're called Personal Sensitive Identifiable Information, or PSI for short. A big round of applause for PSI. Thanks. Okay, thanks. My name is Lauri Lison and I'm coming from Project C, Personal Sensitive Identifiable Information. I would like to talk about the data, about my data, about my behavioral data. It's interesting, if you borrow a car from your friend without permission, it might be a criminal offense. If you do the same with the data, nothing happens. This is going to be changed because Next year, 25th of May, the new EU General Data Protection Regulation comes into force. It states that I will own my data. You will own your data. It affects every single EU resident operating, living globally. But are governments ready for that? Are you ready for that? We decided to conduct a test with Estonian government. This year, early May, we had a hackathon over weekend. And we built a scanner to search for personal, sensitive, identifiable information for, from Estonian government. Public document registries. We found something that we shouldn't be finding. We found a severe breach children's data exposed to the internet, people with disabilities exposed to the internet. Sorry, I cannot show you the details, but there were a lot of documents like this. We approached the local data protection inspectorate, and over the summer they use our tool, the search engine. And I need to admit that today they have fixed a lot of that. Most of those documents are not anymore available because they had a tool to do that, to identify those. That's the same question for every one of you here. Will you be ready for the next year? Will you be ready to protect the data? And we are honored here today to announce that we have something that will help you. We have built a platform, massively scalable platform with support of AI and machine learning to identify those places to identify the places in your IT systems to ensure that you will not breach and that citizens are, are safe. Our children are safe. It's built on top of big data technology and AI, supporting that you really find every single place where personal sensitive data is stored. If you are interested, we are really available for you to start the pilots in every single country in Europe. Just let us know. Let us help you to ensure that you are not going to breach 
next year, 25th of May. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Well, you've seen all five entries now. Uh, what do they all have in common? They're brave and they really represent endless possibilities and success. Now, when I say endless possibilities and success, there's a symbol for that in mythology and the symbol for that is a unicorn. Indeed, a unicorn. Uh, and if anyone has any young kids, I've got two young daughters, they're really into unicorns. Uh, you probably heard of My Little Pony, and my daughter's favorite are, of course, Twilight Sparkle and Rarity. They are her favorite unicorns. Wh why am I talking about unicorns? Well, because our next speaker has a very, very intriguing title, uh, which is Can Europe Build a GovTech Unicorn? I'm, I'm really... I don't know what you're going to say, actually. Uh, but, but to say a little bit about our next speaker, he's the founder and CEO of Public, a venture which invests in, builds, and supports tech startups that want to transform public services. He was previously David Cameron's policy chief and digital advisor. He's also a member of the jury. Please give a big round of applause to Daniel Korski. A big round of applause. OK. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for inviting me today. I'm going to try to make the case that, uh, that all that we've heard today and what this conference is really about isn't just about transforming public services for the better uh, of citizens, although that would be fantastic. And it isn't just about making those public services cheaper, though that would be fantastic. And it isn't just about making governments uh, smarter and able to, to pursue better policies, although that too would be fantastic. I'm gonna try to make the argument that we have an extraordinary opportunity ahead of us. And that opportunity here in Europe is to build not just one, but several GovTech unicorns and become the global center for GovTech, technology to transform public services. Um, and I'm going to make that argument and I'm going to talk you through why I think that is possible using primarily the uh, example that I'm most familiar with, namely um, the British one. But the case basically rests on um, an appreciation of what our friends in California are mainly focused on. And for the, for the, for the, for the better part, it's not about transforming public services. Anybody who's traveled uh, around Silicon Valley and spoken to some of the great founders know what extraordinary, profound things they're bringing to the world. You also will know um, that the idea of the state, reforming the state, transforming the state, delivering public services is very far away from what they think about. And that is not the case in Europe. And that's why I think we have an extraordinary opportunity here. Now, I'm going to put up my friend here to start off by saying, so much of what is driving services is the ubiquity of mobile uh, and uh, digital access. Uh, and governments across Europe are being forced and compelled to change the way they think, change the way they operate, because citizens everywhere, whether they're sitting in water in their bathtubs or not, have come to expect a fundamental transformation of, the, of what's being delivered. But I want to start by taking a step back. Um, because when we talk about GovTech and eGov, what does it actually mean? Um, for us as investors, it's worth breaking things down. And just to sort of start us off, we think of GovTech in these different categories. It's about participation and engagement when governments deal with their citizens. It's about regulation when government regulates things. It's about delivery when government's directly in charge of delivering services, healthcare, welfare, it could be anything. It's about the infrastructure and it's about the administration. And those are categories we use to look at companies like the ones you saw on the stage earlier um, and indeed a long tail of others I'll talk about in a moment. So the reality is that over the last Many years, when government has been buying uh, services, uh, the predominance um, has been of big vendors. Large, uh, established corporations have dominated the market. Um, and you know all the names, Fujitsu, HP, and so on, predominantly American and, and Asian ones, but including a few European ones. But what has begun happening recently, which this chart begins to show, is that they're, they're basically uh, uh, selling less and less into governments. And more and more, although it's not a dramatic shift, more and more is being offered by smaller point solution innovators who've come up with a smart and innovative approach to solving a problem. Um, and the reason why that pressure is taking place are, I think, 
um, in two categories. First, there is a series of technological challenges, changes that have just made it possible to do things in a way that we couldn't do before. The fact that most um, businesses and even public bodies are beginning to migrate onto the cloud means that you can deliver solutions much cheaper and that smaller players can come along in a way that they just couldn't before and offer a real solution. Um, we've talked a bit about artificial intelligence, but things like modular software and the use of big data, all these technological trends are basically allowing us to do things we just couldn't do before. But at the other side, there's a lot of pressure too. There's this, what I call, hyper-transparency. You know, people want to know what's going on. Where is their money going? How is it being valued? And that's creating very helpful pressure for services. Budget pressures have continued since the financial crisis, and people need to deliver things cheaper. Workforce demographics. Younger and younger people are entering public bodies, and they're thinking in court systems, for example, why on earth is my life on a mobile phone, and now I'm dealing with a stack of paper? Why does this paper have to be shoved from courtroom to courtroom so that the judge you were referring to earlier knows what they're doing? Um, so there's this workforce demographic shift, which is leading to helpful pressure for change. And then there's exemplar reforms. Countries like Estonia, Denmark uh, are doing things, and suddenly policymakers in France and Germany are thinking, hang on, why can they do it and we can't do it? And that's happening as much at the national level, at the city level. And finally, of course, back to my friend in the water, there's extraordinary consumer demand. Why can I live my life on my smartphone and yet I have to go to a notary to sell my house, I have to fill in various different forms uh, in order to uh, uh, transact with the state. So you have these two massive uh, trends of pressure coming um, towards us. And at the same time, smart governments are not just you know, in Estonia, have helped facilitate some of the change. And I just wanted to throw up some of the things uh, that the UK government has done, partly when I was there, but certainly before as well and afterwards, um, that has helped create this GovTech ecosystem. So a single front door, meaning government basically projects onto society what, it mean, what, what does good look like. Um, how, how, does, how, how does it want citizens to interact, and what does go, good look like? Secondly, the government procurement portal. It's great to produce lots of different innovations. If you can't actually sell the government, unless you're a very big vendor, it doesn't really matter. And so the creation of, a, of what we call G Cloud, a digital marketplace, which many other countries like the Danes and the Estonians have done too, um, have really helped, and I'll show you that in a moment, um, the take up of uh, new and innovative uh, services in government. Data is something that we've talked about and I'll come back to in a second. And of course the creation of, in our case, the government digital service, which has you know, similarities across Europe, namely a, a squad of great digital innovators inside government. Maybe some of you are employed in those services. But the creation of that service inside government, both to deliver services, but also frankly to teach the rest of the government how things can be done differently. So what has all that done? Well, this is a graph that shows you how much more of spend is now being pulled through into this G Cloud, uh, this platform that has allowed smaller players uh, to sell to government. And even more exciting, if you look at the supply chain when we started out in 2010, compared to what it looks like in 2014, we've seen a real explosion of smaller players, but also players outside of London. Um, so suddenly, you could be in Belfast, and you could sit and innovate, and you could get access to a great government contract in a way that just wasn't easy before. Um, we've taken the data of uh, contracts that are ongoing now, but um, which we know are coming to an end and put it up on a map. And that shows you that over the next couple of years, there's a whole series of really exciting opportunities as large legacy systems are coming to an end and will need new solutions, while at the same time, government has created a system for newer players to come in and has become increasingly weary of the large contracts. So this is just to begin painting the picture of the opportunity that's emerging in GovTech. And in response to that, I want to throw, throw a couple of pictures up here to show you how valuations and investments are going up in this sector. You know, five years ago, nobody talked about GovTech. Um, there was ad tech, there was reg tech increasingly, but GovTech is now becoming something in its own right. This is from the US where we've seen a growth in 2012 from 83 um, to 2016 where we have 336. Um, now, that is, of course, comparatively really small, but it is a very impressive rise over that period, and it's one that's continuing, and it isn't just in the US. So this is the UK uh, deal data. Again, you know, 2013 starts very small, 
um, but a real exponential growth. Now, I wish I could then press another button and show you the European data, but I can't. And the reason I can't is because nobody's gone out to collect it yet. So, you know, for those of you that are members of the European Parliament and governments, you may want to take this with you, but it would be great to collect better data about GovTech deal flow uh, in Europe, in part to show um, where there are opportunities, where there are weaknesses, and so on. I want to throw this one up quickly to show um, in the UK in particular, which has become the global and, and the European hub for fintech, everybody is obsessed with fintech. And I spent years helping build the fintech industry. Um, but according to our valuation, um, the GovTech industry today is already the same size as the fintech industry. Now, it's not B2C, it's not focused on the consumer, it's not as sexy, the potential is probably um, not as big, but it just goes to show that's sort of hidden, uh, hidden in plain sight. There's already an, an established market there. Um, and as a result of some of these trends, what we're seeing um, are increasing valuations. Now, these are American companies. Um, OpenGov, Accela, Nextdoor, and Palantir. Accela was just sold to Berkshire Partners, uh, a Boston-based uh, equity business. We don't know how much they were sold for, but you know, we knew roughly what their valuation was um, when we did this slide. Uh, Gov Delivery, another company that was sold last year to a big private equity company for several hundreds of millions. What I'm trying to say is there's something going on here. Bigger and bigger companies are emerging. They're getting sold on. They're being integrated into other platforms. Um, and, it isn't just in, and it isn't just in the US. It's also in Europe. And I just wanted to throw up some of the companies that we invest and support. We have um, a portfolio of companies that we back, and we run an accelerator program called GovStart which I'm advertising here. Um, and what is so exciting about this sector is, is, is a new phenomenon we hadn't seen before, which is com people coming out of the public sector, doctors, midwives, um, surgeons, uh, urban planners, saying, I know something's wrong with the way that this part of the public sector works, and I think with a little bit of technological help, I can overcome it. And I just want to use one really simple example from Ask the Midwife, because I love this business. Ask the Midwife was founded by Hannah. Hannah was a midwife, um, and she at some point got frustrated by the fact that a lot of her colleagues and herself were um, not being utilized very well. So they were either on shifts or they were being shunted into a room, and in that room they were sitting by a phone and they were waiting for people to call if they had any questions about their pregnancy. Meanwhile, pregnant women, particularly in the UK, would go in for their 12-week you know, scan, and then they would probably go back to the hospital um, only if something severely uh, critical happened, um, or not at all until the pregnancy. So what did that do? Well, first of all, poor utilization of the midwives. They were all sitting there, not much to do, but they couldn't go home. Um, and for the pregnant women, they were either um, going to the A&E, the accident and emergency room, um, when they had very minor symptoms, and so clogging up uh, the time of doctors and nurses there, which really should be used for, for uh, more urgent matters, or they were keeping it in, thinking, I don't need to go, and by the time they then went to the hospital, you know, the complications were much greater. And when they then arrived for the pregnancy, uh, for the delivery, the, 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 the system actually has very limited data on um, the particular pregnancy, and so it's hard to triage whether you should send them to work, you know, to be helped by a more experienced medical team or less. Hannah thought she could deal with this. She's built a platform called Ask the Midwife. It's a B2C play. You can ask questions, you pay 99p, and a registered midwife answers. And you think, well, that's pretty simple. She's built the business in one year, and it has 1% of all pregnant women in the UK asking and answering questions. 1%. That's an extraordinary. 700,000 births a year in the UK. 70,000 women are on her platform. But the really exciting bit isn't just that. The really exciting bit comes now. It comes to the point where hospitals are now in conversations with Hannah because what they're saying is, why don't we just give a login to everybody who comes through the door? If you're pregnant, you get this login, you can ask as many questions as you like, this team of registered midwives are going to answer, and we as the hospital are going to pay Hannah in order to deliver that service. Sure, the hospital could have gone out and built the whole thing themselves. It would have been slower, it would have taken, you know, it would have cost more money, it wouldn't have been as nimble. But in this case, there's a real opportunity to turn this from a B2C play into a GovTech B2G play.
And even more exciting than that is all the data that's being created. We talk a lot about data, about government data, how to manage it, how to secure it. What's really exciting about a platform like this is Hannah's creating a whole new source of data that government doesn't have access to, right? Because it's tracking uh, a pregnant a woman throughout her experience. And so by the time that woman goes into the hospital, there's so much more data available that she can offer up to the medical professionals uh, than the government actually is able to collect themselves. And that's really what I think is one of the really exciting things. So that's just one example, but we're backing companies like RotorGeek that do uh, uh, offender allocation in prisons smarter in order to reduce recidivism rates, digitalize social care, uh, and a range of others. Now, of course, it's not straightforward. These companies are bubbling up, the trends are in their favor, but um, what is it you've got to watch out for? We talked a bit about the security uh, threats, uh, you know, uh, when, when some of the contestants came on stage. You know, cybersecurity is a continued problem, and there are some very outdated, to your point, some very outdated ideas of how to protect yourself. Um, the recent hit by um, some of the ransomware, uh, which is now, what, two months ago, that affected the NHS has really made a lot of people very worried. The second, you know, people worry about their jobs. Hang on, you're going to bring into this uh, prison uh, AI-enabled CCTV footage monitoring? Well, wait a minute, what about the guys that are actually sitting in this room monitoring the CCTV footage? Our view, of course, is, well, those guys are probably not as effective as, they, as the, <laughs> as the, as the AI-enabled uh, software is, but even better, why don't we use those resources on things that only humans can do or humans can do better? But it is an issue. Um, the third is most of these businesses are SaaS solutions. Uh, and, you know, we don't know what the timelines for SaaS solutions are in government. So for investors, there's a little bit of risk here. Uh, and the final thing is that a lot of the most uh, exciting technologies are what we call very sort of point solutions. In other words, they deliver a point problem solution much better than anything else. But government struggles to buy point solutions. It wants to buy, you know, a whole end-to-end -end system. So how do we overcome that? So I was going to finish off by a sort of call for the things that I think need to change. So these are the things I think we need to do a little bit better if we want to build a Europe up into a GovTech uh, ecosystem. I mean, first of all, we have to de-risk the support by those who are responsible for buying. You know, right, you know, there's a saying which is nobody ever got fired for hiring Fujitsu or buying from IBM. We've got to make it easier for officials to risk uh, more, to, 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 to put a punt on a startup with an amazing technology without it risking the whole system and without it risking their budget. So we've got to create various different experimental pots of money that allow officials to, to innovate. The second thing is what happens now is most governments say, we want uh, X percent of our government spend to go into startups and small companies. And the systems integrators, the big boys, they say, sure, sure, we'll put them in the supply chain and so we can bid for this contract because, hey, we've got 10 or 15 of these guys in our supply chain. But nobody reports on this in any uniform standard. So it's totally impossible to judge whether that's true. It's impossible to judge whether it was better this year than last year or to judge whether IBM is doing better than Accenture. So the second thing to help the startup community and to build this ecosystem and ultimately what I hope to be the unicorns is a better system of supply chain uh, you know, audit uh, from government procurement. Third, we've got to pump prime the market. The reason why the fintech industry is doing so well in the UK is of course because of the city and the size of the financial services industry. But we in the government, we pump prime the market. We uh, allow through uh, you know, what's called the British Business Bank, the British equivalent of the EIF, um, money to go into investors that then pass money on to fintech companies. We need the same in the GovTech sector. We need to migrate procurement systems into platforms um, so that it becomes easier, a bit like the G Cloud. Some governments have done it, others have not, and we need to make that migration happen. Um, we need to experiment with different ways of owning and supporting these companies, taking stakes by public bodies, and, uh, and I think we need to set big political ambitions. Uh, it's great to hear uh, the members of the European Parliament and governments like the Estonians and the Danes and so on are doing so, but I think we should encourage our political leaders to set that big global ambition for the kind of sector that they want to see, the services that that can deliver, and frankly, the jobs and investment that could come with it. That's us. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Very fascinating. So, um, what I liked about this, <laughs> I don't, it's making government sexy, isn't it? And accessible. <laughs> um, 
and also the UK leads us. I mean, the UK in the, in the e-government de developmental index is the number one, isn't it? What was the main driver for this massive change in the way? What, what was it that really led the way? It's a great question. I mean, it's going to sound a bit like a cop-out, but it was political leadership. You know, there was a Prime Minister, David Cameron, who really um, came of age, a bit like Barack Obama did in the States, in this modern digital era, and said, you know what? We've got to haul government into a different place. And it was a series of ministers like Francis Maud who saw that big vision or were part of contributing to it and say, hey, what does that mean for procurement? What does that mean for you know, this kind of service and that kind of service? And the fact that there was that sense of political leadership, a generational shift um, that the leadership was part of, which allowed others, including me, to kind of go away and deliver some of that change. And, and citizens have noticed this as well. I mean, it, it gets great feedback, right? Yeah, no, I think there's a real transformation. We should be realistic, right? Um, a lot of the, the changes that we're delivering um, you know, affect people, but as soon as it does, people kind of take it for granted. So we should all be realistic about how much change you actually have to deliver before yeah. people give you credit for it. But I think that there has been a tangible change. Um, you know, the fact that you can register taxes, you register your car, and all these other things yeah. much more easily than before, you know, it does make a difference. And you've, uh, you've seen the five finalists, you probably don't say who, obviously, you've got in mind, but hopefully all of these are potentially great ideas to to, to build on. Right? I think it's super exciting to see finalists like the ones that you've had up on stage here. It's really great particularly to see how they're all thinking about how can they create new categories of data. That is what I think is one of the most exciting areas. Mm. Um, so I've been really um, heartened by, by what we saw and of course I don't want to take the role of the jury away from them, but, uh, right. well, but uh, we'll yeah, there's some exciting companies there. We'll be announcing the winner after lunch this afternoon, so we're all looking forward to that. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you so Thanks, much. Guys. A big round of applause. <clears throat> okay, it's, uh, it's time for lunch. Before we go to lunch, really important announcement. This is super important. You've got to clear all your stuff away. Don't leave anything behind, because they're making changes to the room. Okay, so take everything with you. Uh, when we come back after lunch, uh, we'll be doing a plenary session here. There are more people who want to go to the session than there are seats. Don't worry, because there's going to be another room set up where you can watch it via screens, just here. There are signs outside to direct you towards those rooms, or that room, if you would like to watch that. So, most important thing is, take everything with you. Don't leave anything behind. See you here at one o'clock.